So what is the benefit of this late publication? Well, I just talked with you about the relative benefit, which means percentage. What's the absolute benefit? And here is something for you to take home. Had we published at, five, at 10 years as well, the number of lives saved. But look at it doubled in 20 years. And another 10 years, it increased further. Yes, there have been 10 randomized controlled trials. The two Toronto trials don't count as a population-based trial because they were not population-based. They just asked whether women were interested. 26% of the population was interested. That's not a population-based trial. So actually, what is the most important and most reliable predictor of the subsequent mortality benefit? The advanced cancer rate. So we looked at these eight trials, and we called them the good, the bad, and the ugly. That is, those who cut back on advanced cancer rate to an extent more than 20%, 10 to 19%, and 10%. Here is the good. That is, there is a pretty early decrease in advanced cancer rate, and here is the mortality decrease. Here is the pretty good, quite many of them. You see the relative uh, risk numbers. And here is their mortality decrease. Still significant, but it's struggling. And the ugly is, of course, the two trials in Toronto, which is certainly interesting. Because if there is a control group, if there is a study group, and even if you were not using mammography in the study group, the advanced cancer rate, provided it's good randomization, should be 1.0. Equal, right? Now, these people were doing something very ingenious. There was a 28% more advanced cancer rate in the study group. How did they do it? Well, there must be wrong randomization. How did they arrive at 6% higher mortality? If you don't do anything, then it's zero. Still a big question. Actually, quite a shame. Because these two Canadian trials are the only ones that fail to reduce the advanced cancer rate. It's a colossal failure. Because they just fail to find the potentially fatal cancers. And they are responsible to explain to us how did they do it. So Paula Gordon, who is a professor of radiology in Vancouver, you might know her, says it's just totally wrong that a poorly designed and poorly executed study done decades ago in Canada could potentially cost thousands of American and Canadian women's life. It's a national embarrassment. And of course, I was picking up the pen and say, it's unacceptable to look at a mammographic image quality in the 1980s in Toronto and stop screening in 2014 in the rest of the world, as Tony Miller wants to. I was the person who was invited by Tony Miller to go through to critique their 50 cases. After five cases, I stopped. Then they started to cry and let's go on. After 15 cases, they were convinced that this is not a quality. And quite recently, the UK Independent Committee put pretty clear water into the glass. There is a 20% decrease in mortality, highly significant, as a result of early detection. Then the Dutch came in with a similar result. And then the Swedish organized service screening program try to answer the question every woman asks. Okay, I'm going to attend. What's in it for me? So we had a very large trial, about 15 million person years power trial. Dear colleagues, I just cut it short and tell you that in 60% of the country of Sweden, 43% fewer women die from breast cancer as a result of service screening among those who actually attend. 
But I have a very good news for the colleagues in Canada in a minute. The question of 40 to 49 is lingering all the time, and it's wrong, because none of the studies have been designed with sufficient uh, statistical power to answer the question 40 to 49 and 50 to 59, and so on. But after we published the results in 1985 in Sweden, the politicians started to compete in one county after the other. Let's do mammography screening. And they started to bargain. They discovered that it costs, so they wanted to cut the lower and the upper. And they wanted to screen 50 to 69. It was very interesting. Totally independently from each other, half of the counties had the 40 to 49, and half of the counties didn't have it. Who was the most happy when it was discovered? I was the happiest because this was a natural experiment and totally legalized. So I told, give me 15 years, we are going to evaluate the results. Once for all time, we are going to answer the question about the value of early detection of, in age group 40 to 49 in the era of using modern therapeutic regimens. And, of course, both half of the country got the same therapeutic regimens according to their stage or whatever. Still, there was a 29% significantly decreased mortality. Yes, treatment is very important, but without screening, it's not going to accomplish the same mortality decrease on a large scale. And then, Norway published a 37% decrease in mortality in nationwide screening. And here is my congratulation for Canada. Not long ago, the Pan-Canadian study of mammography screening, service screening, has been published. We can just congratulate those who evaluated 85% of the ongoing screening in this vast country. Be happy. 40% fewer women are dying from breast cancer. Congratulations. For some funny reason, the Canadian Medical Association refused publishing it. Took about a year or longer before they could have it published in America. And then Blake Hady and others published the failure analysis. So after all these I'm building up to this conclusion clearly tells there is unequivocal supporting evidence that early detection cuts back on advanced cancer rate and decreases mortality. Is it perfect? Not at all, but this is the best we have today, and it cannot be explained by lead time bias, length bias, overdiagnosis, and so on. There are all too many anti-screening people who say, we don't need screening anymore, we don't need early detection because treatment is God Almighty. Is that true? Is this a correct way of thinking? Do you mean that antiretroviral drugs are going to make the use of condoms redundant? That's very strange. Let me show you something interesting. 9,000 British women, long-term survival, clinically detected node negative, clinically detected node positive. We know all these curves. But screen detected node negatives and screen detected node positives are in this curve. If you put the two together, dear colleagues, Screen detected not positive cases do better than clinically detected not negatives. Does it tell you something? If chemotherapy was as God Almighty as it believed to, why do we have this significant difference? So despite treatment innovations, not positive disease still has poorer survival than not negative. But only screening can cut back on the not positive cases. But also, there is an interesting comment here. Male breast cancer gets the same treatment, but they are not screened. 
women are screened. So this is not a competition or contest. Both early detection and improved treatment regimens are extremely important to change the unchanged picture in the past 5,000 years. But if you don't know who were screened and who were not, then you cannot tell whether treatment brought in the benefit or not. People started to take it as a fashionable way of thinking and talking and so on, harassing women by saying, the harm of mammography, the harm of this and this and that. Judith Malmgren was so ingenious, just wrote an article. The biggest harm for a woman is that she doesn't attend mammography screening because she doesn't have any benefit of the early detection. There will be more advanced cancers. There will be more breast cancer death. Survival is going to be worse. There will be many more mastectomies and a lot of side effect of adjuvant treatments. So after all these, if this is all true what I'm presenting to you, why the controversy? Dear colleagues, I would be so happy if you took this home. There is no controversy when concerning mammography screening or early detection. Do you know what is controversial? That somehow, from nowhere, a bunch of pseudo-skeptics grow up and one journal after the other give them forum to say the same thing again. And here are these journals that used to have great reputation. I simply call them tabloid journals. And the handful number of people are coming from Denmark and Norway and Belgium. Would you mind making a note that in Europe, Breast cancer death is highest in Belgium, second is Serbia, third one is Denmark. How come that the anti-screening campaign comes from these countries? And of course, if we come to North America, it's Tony Miller and Cornelia Baines and Gilbert Birch and the United States, and of course, your lovely task forces. What is the comment here? The comment is, it, it really is shocking that none of these publications that question the benefit of early detection have access to individualized patient data. So whatever they say, it's a, it's a biased guess. Started in Denmark. doesn't have individual patient data. No, because they go to cancer registry. There is no registry in the world that tells this is a screen detected in a world cancer or outside screening. So Nick Day got so upset in 2000, told this first publication is not only controversial, it contains a number of serious statistical mistakes. It's a worthless piece of work which it if it had been produced by one of our master students, we would have sent it back. Nick Wald, Dan Copen. And if you don't have precision of the data, then you are using words like this. It may be reasonable, suggest, it's likely, unlikely, may have, would. How come that medical journals publish papers like that. Have you ever heard that somebody examined the 10 years of screening and they say, you know what, compared to 10 years before screening, there is no decrease in mortality. Elementary mistake. When the patients are diagnosed before screening started, they bring in their breast cancer death into this era. And these anti-screening people just don't clean up the place. If they were doing it, 52% decrease in mortality would be in the screening era. I mean, it's so painful to experience this, dear colleagues, after so many decades hard 
work. You cannot expect mammography screening to have an impact on patients whose cancer was diagnosed before screening. Where is the peer review process that used to be very important? Not anymore. So here we go to the, the uh, gentleman in America, Dr. Welch, of course, not an expert in screening. He doesn't know at all who were screened and who were not. And he admits, unfortunately, we don't have data. We cannot distinguish screen detected from clinically detected. So what are we going to do? We are making assumptions. And so he calls his study a view from space. And he uses these kind of terms. Assumptions, assumption, best guess estimate, and so on. And it's very, very sad that a journal, so-called New England Journal of Medicine, allows these terms to be published in a single article 71 times. So we are not only talking about statistical manipulation that harms women, but all these are weakened by missing facts. So then, of course, your resource says, oh yeah, it's treatment. You know, it's treatment. But you know, the National Cancer Institute, everybody knows, without individual data about the very exact description, who got and what kind of treatment, you cannot, must not say anything. 